All right. So welcome everybody to part one of Know Your Spine for Better Dancing. It will be part of a four-part series that is doing sort of just a, honestly, kind of a surface look at doing spine, then pelvis, then knees, and then finally shoulders. Feet will be coming later, but I plan to do, I've been studying feet for a long time, so I'm actually going to do, my plan at the moment is to do a 60-day challenge that you and students in particular could do through the summer, where there's just like a little drop of information every day rather than this big sort of overwhelming thing. So stay tuned for that. I will make sure all of you here on this call know about it, should you be interested. So what we're doing today is a kind of like just the tip of the iceberg as with everything, right? Just that little first intro in this case to spine. And rather than doing a deep dive in spine for many weeks, then I want to do sort of a quick overview of pelvis and knees and shoulders, and then you know go back and do a level two on all of them, and then go back and do a level three on all of them. So you just sort of keep doing the layers and layers because of course, anything that you learn in your spine is gonna affect everything else. And therefore you might go, oh, there's something I need to learn about my knees in relation to what I just learned about my spine. Yeah, and then we can keep going deeper. So today my plan is to have you understand a little bit more about basic design and function. And of course the application to that for dance teachers in the dance studio. I have done one recently that's just sort of for, you know, the lay people who just want a happy, healthier spine. But I know that if I give you that information, first of all, you are hopefully a little bit beyond just, wow, my spine flexes and extends and rotates that you're a little bit beyond that. And that what you're really here for is to go, okay, how can I make sure that I'm having a healthy spine so I can have decades of a healthy career? And as what I'm telling my students, not only going to have them have great full potential in their dancing, but longevity. I think that's becoming a thing that's a lot more a common thing to look at these days is it's not okay to have your students perform well at a cost, right? And that cost that's going to cost them, whether it be six months from now or even 20 years from now, I think a lot of teachers are realizing that you can reach a high level of dance and not be crippled at 25 or even 45 because of that. And as much as this is a Franklin method uh, workshop and a lot of the information from Eric Franklin that I've done in the last year is part of this. But also about 20 years ago, I met a gentleman by the name of Bill Evans, who some of you may or may not have heard of. He's quite a modern icon down in the US there. And he does modern dance really based on Laban and Bartiniev. So the developmental movement patterns and Laban and all that stuff. And it was life-changing for me back then as having come primarily from a ballet only background, being already registered for decades or whatever it is now. <laughs> and meeting him, I met him when he was 60 and I was 30. And watching him dance and do concerts like as part of the intensives, I was like, wow. He's such an inspiration, he's 60, you know? And then keep going year after year. And I've followed him around like a puppy practically for the last 20 years. And as a matter of fact, he's, do, he's been doing the Franklin Method training with me. He's now 80 and he's still learning it. And I still watched him dance, not last summer because of COVID, but the year before when we were still there in person down in um, Washington, he still danced in the concert. He still did solos in the concert. And I go, okay, I just gave myself goosebumps. <laughs> I'm like, that, that's who I want to follow. Somebody who is dancing for their entire life. So he's been a great influence as well. And I would love to tell you there's a great resource for him. But at the moment, he's actually working on a book. So <laughs> I can always let you know when that comes out. But to check into the developmental patterns and the um, lob on and all that about just about it's really about healthy, full bodied movement, three dimensional movement. And what I know from years in ballet and then adding this Bartiniev lab on world is that a lot of what we do is not as three dimensional as we think it might be. In fact, I remember the day <laughs> in the um, workshop in this, this two week workshop in the summer when it's like my, my two dimensional sort of on qua mold broke because we do things on the diagonals and we're rotating, doing all this extra stuff. And, and I got a little irritated uh, for about two days. I had to tell my friends, just leave me alone because my little protective shell of my two-dimensional world <laughs> has broken. And now I've now entered the three-dimensional world. It is very dynamic and it made me feel a little off balance, actually, almost even emotionally for a little bit. 
And that's actually what the spine is designed for, as we'll see by the end of all this, is that we're designed to live in a three-dimensional world because it is three-dimensional. So even me doing gestures like this, yeah, I could just twist, but chances are I rotated and extended. And a lot of that we don't tend to allow in the ballet world. And I'm going to suggest to you that there's probably ways to include that into your classes. And you will be spending a whole lot less time correcting or fixing posture when the three-dimensional ability of the spine has been awoken because it's brilliantly and intelligently um, designed to deal with that. And so I have to give a shout out, of course, to Bartiniev and Laban and Bill Evans, and then meeting Eric Franklin. I've been looking at his books for a long time, but to be able to sign up and actually work with them has been amazing and all of his faculty. So with all that said, what else would you need to know about me? Well, I'm a reformed tailbone strangler. Um, back from a misunderstanding turnout, you know, and squeezing that butt together and basically um, <laughs> twisting off all the energy from my tailbone. Uh, releasing that has been amazing for releasing the rest of my spine. Also had a lot of jaw tension, which is probably even related to the fact I'm still wearing glasses. And letting that go has been amazing. And kind of like that, you know, you do something for the top and the bottom and then, oh, all the middle starts to feel better. And I don't feel like I was cursed with a bad spine anymore. I'm like, oh no, actually, you know, it, I probably got the same as everybody and it's perfectly capable of doing anything I wanted to do. I just had to get rid of a few habits that had crept in um, unknowingly, right? Best of intentions. So my goal for today is to get you to understand some basic stuff about the spine that perhaps you didn't know. And I can only speak for myself really, but I kind of go, you know, I went through all this training for years, did a lot of anatomy, and yet still, even just in the last year, I've learned stuff where I go, how come I didn't know that? And so I don't know what you know. I don't wish to make assumptions in a, you know, snooty way, but I am still going to assume that maybe some of the things I didn't know you didn't know either. And you can have some mind blowing moments. And if they're not blind blowing moments, maybe they're just great confirmations and you can pat yourself on the back that you've been doing that all along. <laughs> we'll see, right? Uh, what else do you need to know? Oh yeah, just, um, so again, today, mostly about the design and about the curves, how that plays out in class. The part two will get in more to increasing the movement potential, understanding the facet joints, discs and ligaments. Part three, we would look at the atlas and axis, spotting heads and all the head movements and a pull mount. That's the plan for the moment. Okay, just so you know. So if you go, how come we didn't work on increasing our extension yet? I'd say because we need to enliven our curves first. And you probably even need a chunk of time with that before you layer in the next piece. Okay. Now, part of the Franklin method, and I think even just basic teaching method, is to really understand where you are now. And then when you make some sort of intervention, whether it be a movement, a touch, or a new image, then you check in and you compare to see how it was different. And if it feels like it was a positive difference, then you celebrate and you keep it. So part of what I want to do to start with is just ask you where you're at now. Now you can choose to, um, oh, sorry, just a minute here. You can choose to make it um, a verbal thing. You can put it in the chat. You can just say it in your head, whatever you like. Just the idea of where are you now? And I would also say, this is us looking at also where our students are now. So like, what are your thoughts about your spine right now? If anybody wants to unmute, mute, just go ahead and I'll kind of say your name. We're still all on one screen for me. So if anybody wants to share, where did you get fine? Okay, Katie, go ahead. My spine's very stiff. I um, had an injury about 25 years ago. My L45 disc gave me trouble. It's good for now, which is great, but I do have a bit of a, a kyphosis here in my neck that I really need to open up. Awesome, yes. Okay, well, thank you for sharing. Uh, I actually, oh, I wouldn't say I didn't knew all that I'm about to share with you, but about 20 years ago, working with a local chiropractor where I um, yeah, worked with him a lot, wound up sending probably like a hundred of my students to him. And after, I don't know, about a year, maybe of working with me and my students, he goes, just so you know, you and all of your students have a very pronounced C7. I'm like, oh, and he goes, <laughs> yes, there's something about what you are doing that is making the C7 vertebrae wanna pop out. And I'm like, oh, and basically at that point, uh, he's just said, you're over flattening the curves and that my C7 is pulling back, trying to create more curve again. It's desperate, mm -hmm. trying to do it for me. And, and that was, 
I mean, I'm blessed to have had that eye wake eye opening, you know, wake up call of going, hey, it's not just you. Your 15 year old students are having the same thing. So we can um, hopefully what we're doing today can be some stuff that will help. Um, yeah, I've changes. noticed my tail, all sorts of things. Um, Travis and I are busy doing the RAD masters and we're doing the somatics um, branch at the moment. So I'm discovering all sorts of things and and my, my, my tail has definitely been tucked under a lot. So it's obviously having a, a knock on it. Right, you cannot, <laughs> yes, you cannot affect one part without affecting the whole, right? We, you know, we are a connected closed system, of course. Yeah, anybody else want to share? So welcome, Jubina. We're just doing a little quick share on how we feel about our spine. Okay, Tanya's saying her spine's also quite stiff. At, oh, dislocation, fracture, lower thoracic, upper lumbar. Oh my gosh. Okay. Yeah. There you go. Okay. So um, hard time. Oh, connecting. Oh, hard time connecting. To, okay. Well, I'm glad you're here now, Jovina. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, I'm going to have a hard time connecting to my spine. Oh, to your spine. Oh, I'm not the computer. Oh, got it. <laughs> Okay. Sorry. Sorry, I was late. I just had something else running over. Um, so I'm glad to be here right now. Um, I, I find from ballet, from being so upright, um, I think that it, my spine is so stiff. When I get stiff, I have a hard time finding something. And so it's kind of like non-existent, but I feel it's coming from stiffness, if that makes sense. Yes, it's, I'm just upright. it's not giving you information back. Yeah. You know, yeah. the thing that often happens, right? As soon as we get a, a pain, our body wants to protect us from that, not just the protection as in stiffness, it goes, please don't move that while we're healing, but kind of a, a mental and emotional block of going, you don't need to feel this. We don't want to keep feeling it. And it's, I think it's actually called attenuation. Like if, um, if I were to start tapping your shoulder, it's not quite the same when you do it yourself, but if I was to be tapping your shoulder, you'd be really irritated with me. But if I kept <laughs> doing it, <laughs> you would eventually tune it out. You'd have to, like the coping of the nervous system is going, we don't need to feel that anymore. So oftentimes when we have a chronic pain, irritant, what have you, we stop feeling it over time. And as a matter of fact, like that's a good coping mechanism. But the problem is, is that we disconnect to the area. And it might mean that the movement patterns or whatever we did to get that chronic pain, we're not unwinding it at all because now we're just not noticing it. It's, it's, it's a coping mechanism. It's almost like, you know, your nose running. It's like a good idea. The body goes, can we get that out? But then it just goes overboard and it doesn't end up with help. So part of bringing back your spine actually is just checking in and loving it again. Okay. So if you were to give some more, anybody else want to share anything about spine? Now's your, your big moment, just how you feel about it. So we've got some stiffs. We've had injuries. Yeah. Go ahead, Erna. Yeah. I think upper body, you know, especially having been home all the time, sitting on all these uncomfortable chairs, not moving like we normally move, because we've been out of the studios for so long now. And I just find my, 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 my upper back really, really gets stiff. Absolutely. Okay, but, yeah, well, make sure you show up for shoulders as well, because you're going to really enjoy <laughs> that. But of course, part of the spine would be, yeah, getting ready, getting into the mm. spine and letting that feel appropriate uh, is being yeah huge it's huge yeah right. and i was actually told that i've got no no curve in my upper spine left oh, <laughs> it's all from, from, from straightening it all your life right okay well maybe today's the day you're <laughs> gonna bring back that curve yeah <laughs> uh, anybody else want to share gail go ahead yeah i was just well as far as my own spine is concerned um i mean i'm 62 now uh, but i'm still teaching it's always been um not very flexible but I've never been really very worried about, worried about that because I've not worked as a professional dancer. I haven't got the general physique to do so. I'm more a teacher who also teaches people who haven't got perfect physiques. Um, but at the moment I'm working with three girls who have just done their advanced one. Uh, they're lovely girls. Two of them have got very flexible spines and the other girl is more or less like me. She has to work on her flexibility. and. Uh, one of the things I'm hoping we might be able to address or probably will pop up um, is when there's so much flexibility, you know, and kids these days are seeing so many things on Instagram where flexibility is absolutely taken completely out of proportion, at least for what um, you were saying, if we want to get to, a, you know, a ripe old age and still be dancing, then they're not really looking after their spines. So just thinking that probably 
some of the things you're going to be saying is going to help me with those girls for them to not over exaggerate that flexibility so i can help them know even more how to engage all the core and all the abdominal muscles and not let their pelvis go back so that that makes them feel that they're doing a bigger calm brain than they're doing at the moment. You know, I don't know whether I'm explaining myself. Um, yeah, no, absolutely. And we will get there partially today and probably more in another one as well. Yeah. Fantastic. Today, let's just look at Arabasque or let's look at this. I think the biggest thing that I got, um, you know, I, I'm like you, Gail, where I go, you know, I knew I was meant to be a teacher first. My shins are too short, blah, blah, blah. I wasn't meant, I was meant to maybe be a modern dancer, but not a ballet dancer. Okay, fine. But ballet was my love. So that's where I went anyway. And I always had that sort of, my spine's just not as flexible as her spine, you know? And what I found with this work is the more I get into understanding the design, like kind of just the, I keep using the word brilliant. Sorry if that's overused, but where you just go, I really? Somebody's whatever, human nature, mother nature organized it like that my gosh that is amazing and when I I I was first kind of going like okay well I've got my spine here you know and be looking at it and going that's just like how, how did that get figured out I can't imagine a more amazing perfect design it's not that vulnerable everybody thinks it's so darn vulnerable and then we protect it and it gets stiff even from that and then when I transferred to go the spine isn't amazing and brilliant as this outside entity that everybody else has one of them. It's like, no, actually, I have one of them too. And I think when it comes to the teenagers, let's say, when you really respect something, you won't exploit it either. And I think that might be a huge thing is to, if you really look at what the spine was designed to do and uh, do for a lifetime, that the respect of it might have you just having a slightly different approach. Cause let's be honest, a 15 year old is not thinking of their long-term health. They're just not. And we could say it every day, all day, and it still won't really sink in. So we need to have a different approach, which would be about um, not just even respecting the body. Cause again, that's kind of that long-term health approach <laughs> that they don't go for, but to say, well, how about you explore your spine for all the amazing things that it's designed to do? And, and make that a positive instead of you're exploiting it in a negative sense. Like how can we make it a positive? And then they're gonna be drawn to maybe some new aspects that balance all that out. So that's the hope for a bit today. Okay, so because we're here to make some change and notice and we had some stiffness um, mentioned from some people, let's just get up and wiggle around for just a few moments, however you want. So that's all the space you need. You're not copying me. You can say, oh, I'm gonna do some flexion extension, rotation, whatever, just wiggle around unless you're driving, right, Tavris? But, uh, so I'm just gonna move around and just notice one thing about how you're doing it. And that is, what's your self-talk? So as I'm moving around, what am I saying to myself while I'm doing it? What words come to mind? So am I saying positive things to myself or am I saying more, you know, quote unquote, negative things to myself? Am I going, oh, there's that spot. Oh, oh, that's stiff. Oh my gosh, my upper back today. Oh, I really should be stretching. You know, are you doing all those negative talk? And let's do that on purpose. Let's, let's all get into the negative. So negative words, like maybe it's sticky, it's soft, something that makes it so that it's hard for you to want to move with joy and ease. Just like, oh. And I think dancers, we often use our preliminary movements and our warm up to check in with how we are today, which can be good, but often it's checking in to go, oh yeah, yeah, that spot's still stiff. And we're reinvesting and re putting in and planting, yeah, that spot's still bad. Notice if you're doing that, if you go, oh yeah, mm -hmm, that's where I'm always stiff. Oh, well, oh, maybe today's a bit better. Oh, no, today's a bit worse. Oh yeah. Okay. I think that's a common thing. It's like we check in to go, how close to perfect are we today? And I think our students often do that too, because there's such a goal of the perfection. But now just see, how did that feel? Does that have you motivated to want to really um, explore with compassion, respect, and excitement how your spine can move? Or are you now just maybe a little bit protective and a little bit like uh, judgmental? There's not a motivation there. And if we go back to when Jomina said about being connected, 
are we likely to feel connected to something that has negative connotations or labels? I don't think it's human nature to want to connect to something negative. We want to like, you know, as if the stove was hot, we want to move away from something that's not positive. So what's it like now? I'm going to feed you a few words. And if you want to unmute and add anything, please feel like you're throwing, you know, the veggies into the stew or something. I'm going to say, okay, oh, I have a juicy spine. Oh, my spine feels amazing today. Whoa, I'm like able to slither like a snake. I could actually move quite sensually if I wanted to. Oh, that feels so good. Oh, every stretch I do. Oh, and you're busy making positive sounds. I like all the ones that begin with S somehow. The slinky and the slippery and like I've soaked it all up. And so maybe even slimy for the right student. They'd like that. They're like, oh, it's slimy. <laughs> and it's all likes to move. And after you do a few more of that, any positive words you want to share or you just your own self-talk? How do you feel when you're done that? Now you might kind of go, well, now my spine's with me. I'm happy about it. And I'm going to let, I'm going to discover how it plays out in all that I'm doing. So even just our self-talk is huge. And so you can go ahead and sit down again for a sec. And so having been a teacher for decades, like you all out there, maybe not decades for all of you, but for a while, we spend, I'm sure, we know that we're here to encourage our students. You can do it, all those sorts of positive attitudes. But I wonder how often we make a comment about how great your body part is feeling. Oftentimes we might make a comment that it's looking great, but wouldn't it be amazing if we were helping our students to ingrain into them the idea that my spine felt great doing that. So maybe we did a, just a forward porta bra. And as you do it, you're not talking about the stretch. You're not talking about the how to do it, like the roll up or something, but you're going, oh, and feel it feeling so slippery and slimy as you roll through each part. And then they go, oh, I'm supposed to feel joy when I'm moving my spine. Yeah, you are. And when we feel joy, as soon as we label something more happy and joyous, it, it's almost like the, let's think of it like the, the body parts can get hurt feelings. If you go around calling them negative things, they're like, well, well, fine. If you don't want to be my friend, I don't want to be your friend type of attitude. And so if I start calling my spine names or label it in an unhealthy way, it's not even going to want to cooperate. So even just the mental shift of giving a positive label to a movement Positive label, not by how it looks, but by how it feels. Or you're implanting an image. Um, I saw there like a willow. Yeah, I love that idea. Willow trees are actually my favorite um, uh, trees of all. If I ever get my dream property, it'll have a big willow tree on it <laughs> with a swing, you know, and all that stuff, right? And just that idea of like, I'm strong and supple. There's some more S words, a strong and supple spine. And if I can have both those ideas at the same time, so every time I do a portable, oh, I'm feeling strong and supple. Oh, I probably am. And I don't think it's denial <laughs> that you go, you labeled it something that it wasn't. I think it actually drives you toward that experience more. So that's number one, is let's just make sure that our mindset is positive. And again, this is stuff that's being talked about a lot. And I'm in no way assuming that you're out there um, chastising your students and whatnot. But I think sometimes we look at a step overall that you did that really well, or you're working hard with great focus today and that there's positive affirmations from there. But I'm going to encourage you and suggest to you that you make positive feeling words, motivational words, specifically about a body part. So when we talk about knees, we could be doing our plie saying happy knees while we do it. And that that's going to feel different than just talking about um, uh, the strictness of some alignment or something. Okay, so that's number one is just like, let's, you know, get our positive labels on. Okay, and that that can uh, free up a whole lot of your spine right there. And of course, then the follow up to that that you could use in class as well as for yourself is just even a goal statement. How do you want your spine to feel? So for me, mine would be like, strong and supple, supportive. I'd probably use the word brilliant again. <laughs> favorite word for spine and the one that i like the most 
is resilient. And ironically, you know, all this COVID stuff has really highlighted um, some really key sort of personal development principles because mental health and all that and stress has become something that's much more easily talked about, I think, than even a year and a bit ago. So I actually have here, it's not that fancy, but just me starting this idea of like, what do I do? <laughs> I was doing some coaching thing, you know, and it's like, okay, I, I help people to be authentically embodied. And when I think of the spine and helping dance teachers, but even lay people, I go, the spine to me is about resiliency. And if I have a resilient spine, what does that look like? And how does that play out in my life? My pelvis could be about being stable, knees about being adaptable and so on. But my spine is about being resilient. Okay, that it always knows how to come back to center and be healthy there. So that's something right there. What would your goal statement be for your spine? And if anybody wants to share, go ahead and do that. You can put in the chat or you can unmute. Adaptable, yeah, that's a great one, Davina. Adaptable to everything. And we're gonna to come to this later in the class when I talk about you know applications in the studio. We are expecting our system to be resilient and adaptable without living anymore in a typical world that we were designed for. Our anatomy was not designed to sit in chairs, okay? And the biggest one actually is our anatomy was not designed to be on flat surfaces all the time. We were meant to be walking over all these lumpy things all the time and constantly being able to keep our eyes on the horizon and level. So I, every time I walk, I wouldn't be going like some little bobblehead. <laughs> my upper neck, my atlas axis there is amazingly able to, no matter what I'm doing, it's able to keep itself level because I'm designed to be adapting to the terrain below me. Okay, and I think that's a huge piece and I have some fun ideas on how to bring that back into your dance classes. Not just for the little guys, you know, going over some obstacle course, but a little bit more than that. Okay, so anybody else wanna share like a goal statement or a goal feeling? And then we're gonna move on to some parts of the anatomy. Oh, I see another chat there. Um, oh, that was just, yeah, that was for being a saint adaptable. I saw it so quick. Anybody else wanna say how they want their spine to feel? <laughs> good. I just want to make feel good. Okay. Freedom and fluidity. Yes, that would be great. Fluidity is a wonderful one because of the fact that we are so much water-based as, as humans and in, in the tissues and everything like that. And we're, most people are really connected to anything that's a water image. So fluid is great. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Your, your statements are for you. And let's see if by the end of class you go, I'm a little closer to that goal statement. Right, so if we were wanting to really understand, we can do our, our positive imagery, we can do our positive self-talk, we can have our goal statements and all that. But the truth is, if I don't really understand the design, then even when I'm trying to come up with an image, it might feel good partially, but I wanna know, you know, as the mover or the teacher, I wanna know that what I'm expressing to them is based on proper function. So embodying function enhances function, right? Like if I actually know what's going on. So we're gonna get into some anatomy stuff now. And let's start with just the, a really basic question, which again, input would be great. Do you know why you have a spine? Just a basic thing. Oh, and why do I have it? What's its purpose? So if I looked at anything else, like my car, my house, whatever, my keys, if I don't go, I don't even know why I have these, then maybe you're not gonna use them for their a proper purpose. So what would be the purpose of having a spine? Why do you need one? Anybody wanna, you'd miss it if it was gone, right? <laughs> so yeah, so stand upright and connect brain to the rest of the body, absolutely, yeah. So you can even just say head to pelvis, right? Even though some people would say pelvis is still spine and I'm kind of one of them because it's going on in the, the sacrum there. Yeah, so it's a connecting thing between the head. We don't have our heads sitting on our legs. <laughs> okay, so it's a connector. What else does your spine do for you? Um, it supports the torso, which contains our organs. Yes, absolutely. We need a nice, good, solid structure for all of our internal organs to attach to. 
Okay, so your heart's attached to your spine through some ligaments and whatnot. We know how the lungs are. They're inside the supportive and protective rib cage. So you don't like bang into something and go, oops, you know, pop the lung. Like you, you need to have that protection, those internal organs. So it's attachment points for internal organs and muscles. Muscles need attachment points to be able to create the movement. Anything else? Yeah. There, go ahead, Gail. No, I was just thinking, basically, you know, it, it facilitates all sorts of movement for the rest of the uh, arms and legs as well, and, and to be able to turn the upper body against the lower body, for example, um, yes. spine facilitates that. It's a bit obvious, really, maybe. It's okay. <laughs> we're, we're saying some of the obvious here. Yeah. So I suppose without the spine, you would just collapse, wouldn't you? I Perhaps, yeah. Would you? I mean, would your head just sit on your legs? I don't know. It's some weird alien creature where you've you got your head down to your leg. Yeah. And again, yeah, you'd go, where would all these internal organs go? And where's the structure to, to support all those? Let's also remember, I'll throw a few in there for the more the sake of time, even of going, yes, it gives postural support and movement. Don't forget, it protects the spinal cord. That's a big one. So the design of the bony structure, right? You can, you've been thinking of versus like some just only little soft tissue tube or something. We actually want the bony structure to protect the spinal cord. And another big one, if we were to be that alien creature that had its head on its legs, we would be giving ourselves like shaken brain syndrome because we need the shock absorption to protect our delicate brain from rattling around in our skull. So shock absorption is a big one. So if you think about it, it's got a very diverse job. It needs to be a solid support, but have all this movement. It needs to be able to absorb shock, but be structured enough to have all everything attached to it. So it's kind of like a hmm hmm, the two sides of the same coin type of job that we're asking our spine to do. And what I've found often for myself, we're seeing it in others, is we tend to sometimes focus on one to the exclusion of the other when the design was to do both. And that's what makes it really unique. Okay, so movement, let's look at movement. That's kind of what we're here for as well. So joints, the term joint is generally referring to a place where there's the potential for movement. And I say potential because not all joints and people always move. We can have some joints that are hung out there for 10 years and not, not moved, right? Somehow you're just carrying them around but you haven't really used them yet. And I'm talking feet and spine, actually. So if we include your ribs, your spine has about 100 joints, like over 100 joints. That's amazing. That's a lot of potential for movement. And just so you know, from the Franklin Method perspective, we also talk about joints as being anywhere where movement is possible. And we don't just limit it to a bone on bone, you know, cartilage covering, all that stuff. The, the typical synovial joints out there. We can look at muscles being able to slide over top of each other. And if they were adhered and sticky, you know, maybe the fascia sticky, that that muscle joints, if you want to call it that, or we call them functional joints, if that was sticky, then that wouldn't be working. I think that happens a lot in the shoulders and shoulder blade area that there's some stuff sticking down in there. And you're not able to say glide and slide the way we might want to. Okay, so when you look at joints, what do you know about the true joints, the synovial joints? What do you know about them? Anything you want to share? Just make sure you unmute if you want to share. What do they need? Actually, so the big question hanging out there is, what do they need in order to be healthy and happy? You're like, good question. Well, apart from the muscles supporting them and helping them to move, um, then there must be, you know, some sort of padding, shall we say, like the bursa between the two parts of the joint or however many parts of the joint there are. So it's that the, the bones aren't hitting each other. They've got um, that padding between them to use a, a, a not very technical word. Yes, <laughs> that's okay. Yeah. Yeah, they need, yeah, you don't want to have the bone on bone, right? The bone on bone is when it hurts. Yeah, so often the synovial joints, our true joints, have the cartilage covering, right? Mm. Yeah, 
And Katie, did you want to add something there? I just said liquid. There needs to be some sort of sense of right. Yeah, a sponginess or some. Yeah, absolutely. You're hitting it there, Erna. You want to add on anything? I saw you unmute. Oh, oh, did I? I'm sorry. I was just thinking synovial fluid, but that doesn't sort of say much. <laughs> no, that no, but that's exactly it. Yeah. So it's a synovial joint because it has synovial fluid. And so something that I think you know, but I'm going to say anyway, is that imagine it's a, a ball and socket because that's easier to see. Let's say I painted this ball like all purple. It's got I dipped into purple paint or something. My job as the bone coming in here is to move through the full range as if I'm trying to get my purple paint everywhere. And what that does then is it means I've had points of contact pressure that helps to secrete and then distribute all the synovial fluid. Okay, so your synovial fluid is kind of like the oil in your car. Okay, and the way I get it going, think of a car sitting there, there's no oil distributed throughout it. I have to have it running and moving for the oil to get going. So it's the same thing for us as we need to actually have full range of motion. So what do joints need to be healthy? They need full range of motion. If I only moved in a smaller range of motion and I never pushed and secreted and distributed synovial fluid up here, this area of the joint would start to become in a sense dry. And that's where you get the things like an arthritic knee or hip when you're older is that those joints have been starved of the nourishment of that synovial fluid okay so we're lucky in a way right you know uh think of people with their hips and knee replacements if all they ever do is this then they are not painting fully if they squatted they'd be a whole lot healthier right and by squatted i mean squat a fair amount okay in fact I, i've done quite a bit of teaching over in china the last two years and my squat has had to improve um, I'm sure you can understand why, <laughs> because there, even in like the fanciest um, buildings that I was teaching in, like uh, these, you know, 50 story high rise um, commercial buildings, they don't have toilets. Mm -hmm. They've got the, you know, kind of the proverbial hole on the floor and you've got to be able to squat well or you're, you're in trouble. <laughs> and I didn't want to, I couldn't squat. It would be really hard to squat where your heels lift up like in a grand plie because then you're hanging out there kind of unstable. So I had to learn to actually squat heels down. And it was um, kind of a learning curve for my body. And I was like, oh, I've got no problem. I've been grumpy in my whole life. Uh, yeah, but I haven't been squatting my whole life. They are different. And I had to learn to release in my hips a little bit more. And it was really good for me. And now I don't mind squatting whatsoever. <laughs> so I encourage you to squat. And that goes for in your classes as well. To think that you're doing full range because you are doing grand plie is not actually a, a fully truthful statement. It's great to have that much range, but a squat is different. So I would encourage you to do actual squats, okay? Not even for uh, muscle strength, but for that full synovial fluid in the hips, knees, and there's Tanya squatting away. <laughs> and it feels good, right? Many people around the world hang out there. And, and we're actually meant to kind of hang out there if we um, have remained in that flexible state there, okay? Now we'll get into how to do that better when we talk about the pelvis, because there's probably something in the pelvis if you're finding squatting a real challenge, don't just blame your hip joints or your knee joints or your you know, tight Achilles or something. It's often something that's not being allowed to happen in the pelvis. So that'll be next week. We'll get y'all more, more squatting next week, okay? Now let's look at a little bit more to do with the design of the spine itself, okay? So it's got all these jobs to do. Now, if you look at it from the back view, it looks a lot just like a column. And actually, <laughs> I even use my arm as an example, where it's thicker at the base and then it gets narrower as it comes up, kind of like an obelisk even, okay? So it's a very stable thing, having the thicker base and then the narrower to the top, um, makes it stable. And then if when we look at the pelvis, you'll see that that's like an inverted triangle underneath it. And I've got a picture for that coming up, okay? But if we look at it from the side view, well, ta-da, it's got some curves, right? Now these curves sometimes are harder to see with all the soft tissue in the body, okay? Like the lumbar curve is actually probably bigger than you might think. And I know for me, returning my curve in my rib cage was huge. 
to actually have what's um, lordosis kyphosis often are used as terms to mean like too much or something but they're really just the terms of saying oh it's a lordosis it's a kyphosis it's a lordosis okay and to actually return that that's where most dancers we really over flatten in the thoracic okay so it's got all these curves and that's going to be our big um, focus for today okay we're going to look at now the design of why those curves started to happen. So let's say I'm an animal, I'm a cat <laughs> or a cheetah, and I've got my spine kind of like a suspension bridge and I've got my limbs coming down here. And I just kind of, I go along the savannah, contracting, doo -doo 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 -doo, going around like that. Pretty effective. They've got their head out there and they are able to move with great, great speed on their four legs. Now let's look at what the design of the human is. Well, what if we kept the same design as a mammal? And we said, we're gonna be up right now on only two legs. Is that gonna work? <laughs> Maybe like Cedal, already sag over. <laughs> My head would be looking at the ground. I wouldn't see anything. I'd be totally lunch meat for something like almost immediately because I wouldn't know where to go. All right, so just going like this and going, oh, okay, is this gonna work? No it starts to sag. And in fact, if you look at say the apes and gorillas of the world, where you kind of say maybe they're an intermediary between is they've got massive spine muscles to try to hold themselves up. Massive, massive spine muscles, much more than a human does or most other animals. Okay. So go, well, all right. What works for mammals doesn't work for us. Okay. Well, now that we're upright, what if we decided, I'm going to use my smaller one. What if we decided to just be upright then? Is this gonna work? Anybody see problems with this one? Yeah, okay, Erna, what would be the problems with this one? <laughs> that, that there's no shock absorption as such. Yeah, there's a heck of a lot of compression. <laughs> Crash, right? And conversely, so we've got the compression down, but we'd also have the ground force coming up. There'd be no shock absorption and our head would be Ugh! Right? Yeah, so being perfectly upright doesn't work. What else is the problem with being perfectly upright? Uh, go ahead, Tanya, yeah. Just saying you can't, wouldn't be able to actually do anything. You couldn't lean forward, you couldn't sit down, you couldn't yeah. because there's no, <laughs> so we would just yeah. be standing there. Just, you know, <laughs> maybe you've got some neck rotation, you're just like, yeah, there'd be nothing you can really do. Now, remember too, one of the uh, things about uh, why we have the spine that we have is for muscle and organ attachments. So I guess if we're not really moving, we don't need a lot of muscles, but we still might need to have our organs. So what's gonna happen with our organs? How are we gonna put these on us? Are we gonna like, you know, just stick your heart here and maybe a lung back here and, okay, let's put a kidney here, but we'll hang the liver here. Be like a darn Christmas tree which is this little stick with all these organs hang, hung, hanging, hanging off of it. That's not gonna work. That also makes me very, many, really uh, vulnerable to attack, right? Because the good old mammals, when they're here, all of their heart and lungs down here, all their internal organs are here. Their tail even protects their genitals and um, anus and all that. So they are very protected with all of their organs. And you know, if you've had a cat or a dog, it's only when they trust you that they flip over and go, you can, you know, touch my vulnerable belly, right? But we'd be going along going, ah, sure. Yeah, kick my kidney, kick my belly. Doesn't matter, whatever, they're all just hanging off here. So we know this doesn't work. <laughs> so what do we do? What did um, mother nature, evolution, God, what have you? What was the de brilliant design? So let's go from the animal version, go, okay, if we go to here. Well, this isn't gonna work. Oh, and I forgot to mention, don't forget um, propagating the species. How exactly are we gonna have a big uh, <clears throat> baby hanging here without, <laughs> that's not gonna work at all, right? Okay, so here we go. We've got our, our mammal spine trying to come upright and going, well, this isn't gonna work. So the first thing we wanna do is get our head back over our base of support and able to look out, ta-da you now have a cervical curve. So that's already a better. But again, I'd have the problem of baby and all that particularly. So how about I put another curve there 
Oh, hang on. <laughs> Got to get my hand gestures down here. That looks lumpy. Just a sec. Okay. <laughs> so cervical. I'm going to go a little lower, and then I push into the lumbar curve. Yeah. So now I've got a place for the baby to be. Actually, sorry, here would be all my internal organs and my lungs and stuff. And then down there, I've got a place for the baby to be where if, as the baby develops, I would just arch a little bit more, right? Or perhaps lean back. You've seen ladies do that, of course. All right, so let me go through that one more time. So the brilliant design is let's get our parts stacked over our base of support. Let's be able to see the horizon. Let's have these cavities almost for creation of safety of internal organs and support. They're still pretty vulnerable by being at the front of us. Okay, but now we can see and got our arms and can protect ourselves. And let's have a lumbar curve for the sake of adding all this additional shock absorption and weight of baby. Okay, and I'm sure that that makes sense now. You're like, oh, okay, so we have all these curves. Okay, now I'm gonna go ahead and look at our a little screen share that um, I did for you all. And let me know if you can see that. You can all see that? Yay, alrighty. Okay, I guess we do play and then it'll go bigger for you too. All right, so there we go again, just showing you the picture of like the curve there. Now, if we move on to the next one, you can see again, talking about how uh, apes, gorillas, what have you, they have a little bit of a change by becoming a bit more upright, but you notice that they just have a little bit of a cervical curve to have the eyes on the horizon, but they didn't come all upright giving the need for a lumbar curve, okay? There's nice pictures of the shape of the spine showing the double S or the S shape and the pyramid idea from the back. Here we are with the double pyramid stacked on top of each other, the obelisk shape and then the sacrum of which for our purposes, I call part of the spine. But when we talk about pelvis next week, I'll call it part of the pelvis. <laughs> so it kind of just depends what part you want to talk about it. It's like the one that, you know, it's got two personalities. Which one do you want me to be part of? All right, now moving along. This part of information, it's great if you know it, but it really doesn't overly matter that you can throw out the words. I think sometimes that's nice for students to hear the actual typical real medical words. I think that's nice. There's no reason they can't learn it. Okay, we've got our cervical vertebrae, then our thoracic, lumbar, and sacral, of which the coccyx is the same. So coccyx, people tend to say tailbone. That's up to you. Of course, some teenagers giggle at the word coccyx. So <laughs> say tailbone if you need to, that's all right. <laughs> now they are grouped and given their name for two reasons. One would be, you can see that they each have their full direction of curve. As soon as it's going in the other direction of curve, it's another section and another label. And that other section, other label also is because each type of section has its own shape to the bones. So like a vertebrae here, this is a lumbar vertebrae. And I know that because of the shape of it based on the type of movement that needs to be available at those spots versus looking at a, um, this one would be a, oops, tossing these things around. This one would be a cervical one because of the nature of how it's shaped. So we're gonna look at a little bit of the shapes, just a little bit. We get into that more when we're looking at the movement, however. So that would be the next time. Putting the curves together, um, when Travis has said about being like a wave, we'll hear you, or being fluid, here you go. Taps right into our fluid nature if we think of it as a wave running through us. Okay, your primary curves are you being that curved thing in utero. Then when you are first born and you're on your tummy, you will start to do lifting head actions that help to develop the cervical curve. You didn't have it when you were first born. Then Kicking your legs <laughs> and pushing around starts to develop the lumbar curve, okay? As well as, of course, pushing up on your arms, you're gonna get more of a lumbar curve. So in our development, in, within the first two years, we're getting those curves, but the curves are still, just so you know, are deeper as an adult than they are even as a child or teen. 
those curves deepen a little bit over time as we continually develop. And just a sort of bug to put in your ear later when we're talking about feet, say in a foot one. Oh, there we go. There's the curves. Things say about them completing later. Is this idea of primary and secondary curves? And to just draw attention, I think you can see my, oh, no, you can't see my cursor when I'm on the full one. But just have a look down at the arch of the foot and it's labeled as a secondary curve. So a lot of times challenges in the feet, such as a flattening arch or a non-resilient arch can be linked to the other secondary curves or the whole curve chain really being disrupted. Okay, so hyperextended knees where I'm curving the other way will mess up into the feet, will confuse the spine, all that. All these curves work together. So I've started with spine, like in this series of stuff, because it's the, the biggest one that if I change in there can make a huge change everywhere else. So if I'm trying to go around increasing my arches of my feet and get that resiliency there, but I haven't addressed my spine, you're, not, you're only going to get so far because it could be linked right back to spine. All right, so now let's just look at a few key points. These points will become much more relevant when we're looking at movement, but just a quick one going through here. So this one that's on the screen here is a thoracic vertebrae, and you can tell that because it's got the ribs attached. Versus seeing it, oh, that's my alarm, to remind you that if anybody needs to go to the washroom, just <laughs> bio break at any time, it's on you. We could take an official one, but I'm okay to keep going, so, all right. Uh, so the body of the vertebrae is where the weight is actually transmitted. The weight of the body building down or the force coming up. The sticky outy bits are referred to as processes. We have transverse processes, ones that move sideways, just like you talk about your transverse abdominis, the side to side. And they are where a lot of muscles attach as well as ligaments. Same thing with the spinous process, which spinous doesn't refer to the spine because you have a spine on your shoulder blade, for instance. It's about your, um, the fact that it's, again, something that sticks out for attachments. Okay, so that's all you really need to know at the moment. And that the movement, and again, we'll explore this the next time, happens at the facet joints. These little things that look like little ears on it, where one sits on top of the other, kind of like little, deck of cards where they slide up and off each other or they spin and rotate on each other okay so more on that later let's get to oh well here's a nice one though i threw in there just for you to see the lumbar vertebrae how it just kind of slides up and down and just a quick note that i'll say right now you see there it says rotation of only one to two degrees that's because of the direction of the facets there's no way for them to rotate the way they stick on um, they kind of go on like little earmuffs. <laughs> if you're talking about if I'm, my head is the bottom vertebrae and this, the top one just kind of goes, whoop, sits down and comes up and sits down. But when they're on each other, there's, there's not room for rotation. So we really need to explore the rotation and the thoracic. Okay, moving along though. We will take a moment on discs and come back to it more later. But first, before we get into discs, let's just stand up and move around for a moment, a little bit more. Okay, and we're going to just look at all the options of our movements. So I'm going to stop the share so that you can see me a bit more if you need that. Okay. There you go. All right, so we have our flexion and extension. So let's just do some flexion and extension. A suggestion would be to bend your knees when you flex and to extend. It's typical to naturally want to extend a bit when you go. Now, this is different, just so you know. This is different than if I was doing a, a back arch where I kept my pelvis steady. So my I'm allowing extension this way, which is different than me just going into the back space. Okay, so go ahead and let yourself basically feel like you're doing a heck of an anterior tilt. Okay, because that would still be extension. I can go all the way back there, or I could be extending here, but I do want you to let it be through to the hip joint, okay? So you've got your flexion and extension, flexion and extension. You have as well lateral flexion. Suggesting if you're just doing pure lateral flexion would be to allow that leg to go out. So I'm kind of doing like a little step touch if I'm going side to side. <laughs> and I can't help but feel my arm wanna just get involved there. So we're doing this nice little 
dance, lateral flexion there. Okay, and then we have rotation. I'm just gonna give you an easy rotation thing to do that again, as much as you think your students might know this, um, never hurts to do it. The old RID, of course, if those of you who are RID had a lot more rotational stuff, I still do all that, just so you know. I do it all the time. Um, I would do this before I work on arabesque, actually. Like I get my rotation going before I do an adage in the center or something. Okay, but an easy one that you can do for all ages, especially if say you're teaching adult beginners, is to imagine I've got like little sticky gecko hands or Velcro hands or something. And I'm gonna go right here. My arms are gonna stay right in line with my chest. And I'm gonna imagine there's a Velcro wall over here. And I'm gonna see, can I rotate enough to go and stick onto that Velcro wall? Then pitter patter your feet around so that you end up twisting the other way. Unstick your hands, retwist. So in my case, I'm twisting to the right. It may look different to you on screen there, but so whether you, you, you can say right, you don't have to follow me. So I'm gonna twist to the right, stick, then twist my lower body all the way around. So now it's like I'm twisting to the left. So unstick, retwist to the right, go around. Let's do a total of three full rotations. And be honest with yourself about whether you're actually doing it in your spine or whether you'd moved your arms over. And it's pretty easy to move your arms over and go, oh shoot, didn't notice that. <laughs> now, of course, we need to go the other way. So I'm gonna go stick, put a pattern my feet around, unstick and restick. Boom and keep going. And this one's a fun one. Kids love to do that. You could do it. When you're non-COVID times, it'd be fun to go to a partner and go, hello, partner, and then see if you can keep talking to your partner. Oh, and then there's another partner here that, so you'd have them all in a nice little line where they get to say, like a pat -a cake dance almost, <laughs> to wake up the rotation going around. And pat -a cake to the next partner and see if you can stay there. Okay, so that's kind of fun. So there we go. We've just got a little bit of movement happening. Now, wanna go back and introduce the idea of the discs in that. So we'll get more into the um, movement of the facet joints another time. But right now, let me just reshare and say, okay, a little bit about the discs and then we're gonna do those same movements again, all right? So the discs, the discs tend to have their own story for how people feel about them. You know, generally when people hear about discs, it's because it was a slip disc or a herniated disc or something like that. And people get really worried. What they tend to get worried about is imagining that this ball is a, a disc. So my little, my little um, cushion between the vertebrae so that I don't have bone on bone, of course. But it's more than that, right? But here's what people get worried about. A sudden movement that goes bleh, and then out goes that stuff in the middle. And a nice image for the, the, the stuff in the middle is to just think of it like a jelly donut. That there's this outer formation that has two characteristics. It can be strong or it can be very supple and we'll get to that in a moment. And then this inner bulb, so there's your fancy words, the annulus fibrosis is the outer bit. And it's very much like layers upon layers, like a weave all the way around it. Think of it almost like layers and layers, like how a tire has layers and layers and layers and layers, okay? But it has some stretch. So when there's compression in the spine, it actually does stretch out just like this ball is going here. I'll show you this angle. It does get wider. We, we call that circumferentially stretched. So there's a fancy word for you for today. <laughs> so the whole circumference, right? So a circumferential stretch where it all bulges out. And then the mucus pulpulus. So think of the pulpy center that can move around and it's got a different texture. Now, why is this relevant? Well, here's the part that's super cool. Um, go down is that it's got a changeable nature. If I'm moving nice and soft and there's not great impact coming, I'm just moving, it's really gentle and squishy and it can move just like you were running your hands through the water. But if you were to do a sudden impact, and to me a sudden impact would simply even be landing a sauté, okay? It immediately, in fact, what's fascinating is it doesn't respond because of impact it pre-responds, it knows you're about to land and it responds and becomes incredibly strong and resistant. Just like, think of the difference between running your hands through water, you're like, oh, water's soft and gentle. Yeah, well, when you do a belly flop, it feels a whole lot different, doesn't it? 
<laughs> the suddenness of it. And so our, our discs are much like that. They're like water, but it's like, depends how it feels and, and what its structure is gonna be like depending on what you're doing. And I'm sure you've all felt this idea and that again comes a bit later on the, the slides of where you were um, walking downstairs, maybe you're carrying something so you couldn't see and you thought there was one more stair or one less stair, whichever it may be. And you, your brain wasn't pre-prepared for how to be responsive to the next impact. And boom, oh, like mm -hmm. I'm, I know in my life, I've at least a few times given myself an outright headache simply because my spine was not prepared for the impact to come. Okay, and that's not just muscles and tendons and all that responding to brace you. In fact, it isn't, you don't, it's nice to get rid of the idea of bracing. Bracing to me has a real negative fear-based connotation. I'm bracing for impact. Moving through life has impact. Let's not make it something to brace against. Instead, it's just the texture changes and is responsive to what you're about to do. The part that we're gonna get up and do in just a moment here is noticing that that little bulby thing moves. It moves inside there. So rather than thinking of squishing my vertebrae down on the disc as being a negative, it's like, well, no, that actually happens and it's what's supposed to happen. So if I'm squishing down here, so let's say I'm in extension or sorry, flexion. So this side is the side that's flexing and getting bigger then this side is squishing. It's supposed to, that's why we've got them. And then the, alternatively, in extension, that side would be squishing. But the part I want you to see is that that little ball in the center would be rolling along as you go. It gets displaced. So if it's here in the middle, and then I go into some flexion that's gonna squish here, it's gonna scoot it back, okay? Now, when I have a sudden action, Maybe it will split right out, touch the spinal cord, and now you've got yourself a problem, and you will know it. <laughs> but what's more common in, um, I'm going to say older people, <laughs> is if you resisted the idea of any compression at all, because you were so afraid of this. And if you think of back to the synovial fluids, what do they need? They need the nourishment of movement in order to get the liquid distributed. Your discs are much like the same. They need the squish. So let's look at this part. They need the squish to get rid of like, think of it as old fluid. And then they need the reinflation to absorb in new fluid. They need the old and then the new. So if I chronically have a compression in one area because of my posture, then it never gets to reinflate and rehydrate. Conversely, if I never squish it because I'm protecting it and don't bend there, it never gets rid of the old and gets the chance for fresh. Okay, so it can become dry and think of a, a dry sponge is becoming cracked. And then those little cracks is where the, that stuff in the middle can sort of seep out. And then you start to get that pain, not from a sudden acute injury, but from almost, it becomes like a chronic thing, but what's happening and what caused it was lack of movement. So ironically, our fear of moving is usually what causes the problems more than the movement ever does. So that's good that we're dancers because we're gonna keep moving more than the average person. But are we? Oh, are we moving all of it? So thinking of those moving things here, let's get up and do the exact same thing of flexion extension, but this time just pay attention to the rolling ball that is the nucleus inside your disc. So let feel yourself squishing your discs. So it's not just the idea of a marshmallow, because that doesn't have two things going on, right? But a marshmallow that maybe it has the marble inside the marshmallow. Something where you've got the idea that it's rolling. So if I'm going into my flexion, my disc is squished at the front and the nucleus populus or the ball would be rolled to the back. And then it rolls to the front and rolls to the back. So if I'm gonna have fun here going between flexion and extension, I'm really playing with rolling, think of it as like playing with rolling the ball between your joints, which is what's happening inside the disc. So I roll it to the back when I go forward and I roll it to the front when I go back. And it's sloshing back and forth. So again, sloshing is a very uh, liquid image. So that works really well for it. And when I think of my disc sloshing, I honestly, I don't, I can't think of individual discs. I can't suddenly think of five discs all at one time. 
but it really gets me into that fluid idea of something sloshing. Okay. Same thing, of course, if I'm doing lateral and it's sloshing to that side and sloshing to that side, sloshing and sloshing and sloshing. Okay. I think children would even understand this a little bit, or all you do is you talk about sloshing and fluid there. Now, one quick note about rotation, just pop up so you can do this. We often think about rotation of saying, oh, I've got to be really well extended in order to have room to move. However, if you think about something rotating, okay, um, I'm good. Let's see if you can see it. The way my screen looks, it's like you can see, I'm gonna put my hand right at the top of my screen. At least the way it looks for me. Now, if I rotate, oh look, my hand went quite a bit down. You see how I got it got shorter, right? So if I'm measuring my eight inch sponge, by the time I've rotated it, it's shorter because the length of it got used up in the rotation, right? So keep that in mind when you're talking about rotation. So go ahead, hop up. Lengthen, 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 like we often say to do in dance and try to rotate. Now, you're not gonna collapse, you're not letting go or anything, but just allow the fact that when I rotate, know that because of the twisting of the fibers, and we're talking in the actual disc even, I will get shorter. That's also all the ligament connections. And again, more on that the next time, but just for a start, go ahead and let's do one circle each way. Okay, our little gecko hands or little Velcro hands there. And note that if you allow yourself probably to breathe out would be good for this, that I am allowing myself to get shorter when I rotate. So when I'm de-rotating to get to the other side, I might get a little taller, then I get shorter again when I rotate, maybe a little taller in the middle and then shorter again as I rotate. Now, could the naked eye see me get shorter? Probably not. Let's go the other way, but at least I'm not cueing something that's against how the anatomy actually functions. So here I go. Let's do it the wrong way. So lift up and twist. Keep lifting up, keep lifting up, keep lifting up. Try to be taller every time you twist. Do that one again. Lift as tall as you can. Make all the space you can for your turn. Oh, and I've been holding my breath and I'm not really sure that I rotated fully. Now let yourself just be, be you. Oh, the twist lets things shorten a bit. Again, I derotate and there's going to be an, a rehydration of the disc so I get a little taller until I rotate again. You rotate, rotate. So that what's happening while I was twisting was this, right? I twisted one way, got shorter, derotated, got a little taller, and then twisted the other way, right? So that those discs are getting twisted and sponged and wrung out in a really healthy, appropriate way. Instead of trying to make it twist where we envision this or something, <laughs> okay? All right. Now, in order to get really into the curves and ideas of that, there's a little bit about uh, how the body works best just from a physics point of view that I need to go through. And then we're going to look at the curves, hopefully the next 15 minutes, and then spend the last half an hour on uh, cueing, common cues in dance and application in class, okay? So the water. Alrighty. Um, any questions though before I move along? Everybody's good? Okay. All right. Well, let's let's keep going there. Okay. So here's a fun fact <laughs> that uh, you know, you could say, I'm made for dancing. Well, ana anatomically wise, you were made most of all to be an efficient walker. Okay. You're in everything about your system. If you think about our ancestors, so there's a little example of them there. They were hunter-gatherers and they had to co cover great swaths of land, great swaths. And we had to get really good at looking for food and maybe even, you know, like that idea of set up camp here and then go look for food. Oh, we've, we've used up all the food in this area. Walk again, set up camp here. And then we were constantly nomadic, right? Which means I'm always walking. Now, if we were very inefficient with how we moved, that would mean we're burning a lot of calories just to do anything. We'd be using a lot of muscle, which uses a lot of calories. That would mean we'd be spending all of our life looking for food. So if I consume 2000 calories, but then the next day I spent 
1,500 of them just looking for the next 2,000, I wouldn't have any extra caloric intake to fuel things like brain development, thinking, coming up with tools so that maybe I don't have to walk so far, whatever. okay? So one of the big differences between animals and ourselves is they're not very efficient. They're really good for what they need to do. So like a cheetah can run fastest thing on the planet, right? But it's got about two minutes into it before it needs to stop. And we could though, as you know, not outrun a cheetah. We could outwalk a cheetah. We could outwalk an elephant. We could outwalk a dog or a cat. We can, when we're moving appropriately, outwalk anything else on the planet. We are that efficient. And there's a little percentage there that when we're walking properly using the elastic nature of the body's design and structures, we get 93% of our energy back again. So only 7% of my intake, my calories and usage of all that gets used to actually for the muscle work of doing what we're doing here. Oh, sorry, just got an idiot person here. Okay. Uh, welcome, Stephanie. Thank you. Okay, happy to have you here. And you'll get the recording, so don't worry about what you've missed, okay? It's right. not your fault, Abby. Okay, so we've got our efficiency and resiliency. And you know, too, at the beginning when I said, to me, spine is all about being resilient. But our whole structure is about that. Okay, so that's number one. We're designed for efficiency and resiliency. And we're going to look at the spine with regards to that. The other thing we're designed to deal with, of course, is the gravity and ground. We already mentioned a bit about that. We've got ground forces that come up and our weight that comes down. Now, we are not designed to try to pull away from gravity. We'll never win. Gravity always wins, okay? And when I think of um, gravity, this makes a bit of a sound, sorry, but if I think of these little tube things, if I think of our spine, if we go back to when we were hypothesizing what it might like be like if we were straight, then gravity, which pulls us straight down, that's our plumb line, would have, be prepared for the noise, would have a great deal of compression. Let's see if I can do this. Just straight down. Even that doesn't want to go straight down. All that compression down. Ugh. Even that, actually notice, this is actually a good fact I can't do it well, it's a good thing. When I go straight down, it still wants to bend, doesn't it? <laughs> wants to avert the forces. Okay. And then we have coming up from below and adapting to all the changing terrain. Okay. So we've got that we're dealing with. So what does that mean for our spine? Well, I already mentioned this idea that I need my shock absorption and the transmission of force protecting our brain. So we've got all the force coming up and all the force coming down. We need to absorb it. And part of the way we absorb something. Okay. So if I were to suggest whack my hand down, that's going to hurt. If I whack my hand down on the sponge, it hurts a whole lot less. Now, why is that? Any thoughts? You can't see everybody, so put it in the chat. Oh, you know what? When I screen share, I can't see chat. Well, that sucks. Okay. Well, in that case, to keep the screen share on, I guess I'll just let you know. If I'm going here, the reason this gives less pain and impact is because it slowed me down. Maybe by a milli, milli, millisecond, but it slowed me down and distributed the force. So all the force didn't just go to right here. It got slowed down and spread out. That's what shock absorption or force transducement, transducing force could be also looked at, okay? Now the cool thing, the part that blew my mind, it's like I knew this, but I didn't really know it in the spine is this next bit here, okay? So if we've got our curves in our spine here, When I have my force coming down or up, right now I'll keep doing down, it just goes through the curves. Well, we know that, right? It's kind of like it's acting like a spring, okay? But it's not just acting like a spring in this way. What's actually happening is it's acting like a spring to the tissues out here. So I'm gonna use my little TheraBand here. So if I'm this pretend this is like part of the curve of the spine. And when it gets moved back more, it stretches 
the tissues that are on the outside. These would be the ligaments and the smallest muscles. When it stretches like that, the body has been brilliantly designed to turn the stretch energy into kinetic energy. So the reason I got the picture of the balloon there is you think of a balloon as this thing that's all stretched. Then when you let the air out and it can convert instead of staying contained, it flows all over the place because it had movement energy, right? The balloon doesn't suddenly have muscles or wings or anything. It's the um, kinetic energy being released, right? So here we go again. So if this, let's say, was a lumbar curve and I'm letting my lumbar curve change and increase, I now get stretch energy, stretching on the tissues, fascia included, right? And then what does it want to do? It wants to, wants to actually send it back. It wants to be released and go back, right? There's another picture of a spring here. So instead of thinking of the springs this way, which we typically think of a spring, you can think of the springs as being this way, the curve pushing into that spring, okay? Getting all that potential energy. So I hope what you're getting right now is, oh, wait a minute, my curves move and give me energy. Yes, yes they do. That's why we're such efficient walkers. Another little picture on it here. You know this one of the, the slingshot. When I'm pulling it back, the thing that's in the slingshot, I should get a slingshot as a prop, shouldn't I? <laughs> All this stretch energy is ready to go. That's kind of like a plie to jump, as we know, right? But that plie to jump happens in your spine as well, if I let it compress. So I'm going back and then it wants to go. And then I'm just putting a little note in there because I don't, I don't actually have plans to do a stretch class at this moment, but um, putting it out there to make sure everybody's getting the latest info that a static stretch held for too long, like we're talking the 30 second minute long stretches, cut your power, your exert, your um, explosive power for like by a considerable amount for up to an hour or so after. So gone should be the days of doing a heck of a big, say um, hamstring stretch after the end of the bar and then expecting like grand allegro, grand jetés to have any power. You're really setting students up for damage there. So do just kind of a full body, I'm just a dynamic stretching, meaning I never stop moving. That's all great. And then if you really want to reset muscle length stretches, you do that at the end of class after the expectations of power. And since many of you probably have students that take this class and this class and this class, uh, I know that if I'm their ballet class after the jazz class, we can do a big stretch. But if I'm their ballet class before their jazz class, no, they're going to have to do the big stretch after at the end of jazz. And that's just communication within the studio and teachers. But I digress a bit, but just since we're talking about stretch, make sure that that's out there to help you keep your students safe. Okay, now another idea then is this idea that when we are correcting our students, it's so much easier to get your hands on them when they're still. <laughs> of course it is, but it's also often confusing things because being static if I'm trying to ask a student to, let's say, find the power for that rise, but they stood still getting corrected before it, they're, where they're choosing to recruit the power from is not really the design of how the body was, which is stretch energy into kinetic energy, stretch energy into kinetic energy. Okay, so, so if that girl got their pelvis all beautifully aligned and was asked to rise, that's different than say, maybe you do a rise without paying attention too much and then go plie rise and find the second rise as the response of the plie. Now you're gonna be able to talk about the stretch energy. So I think that's a tricky thing. I love doing hands-on corrections, but what's interesting is the longer I teach, the less I do because I go, darn it, the only time I can get my hands on them is when they're easily is when they're still. I'm sure you all have the stories of being injured. I got a black eye once from coming in to help, you know, the rib cage come around, arms are up here doing shenes, and I just, you know, got clocked and by the elbow by a tall girl, yeah. So I learned my lesson about maybe we don't always try to help them when they're moving. It was a rookie mistake, wouldn't didn't do that again, but not fun to go around with a black eye, I'll tell you that. People give you pretty concerning looks. And when you say it's a ballet injury, they just don't believe you. <laughs> All right, so now back to, this is super important. Let's have a look at Again, more on this the next time, but all these little processes, right? They're attachment points. In this case, we're talking about for muscles and you've got ones that connect one vertebrae to the next, then ones that connect 
up a two or up a three or up a four. But the big ones that we tend to feel and use for all our voluntary movement, they're not connected in this way at all. They're like the long ones that do like from top to bottom, okay? It's the short little tiny muscles though that do all the stabilization. And you can think of them the same as when I was saying this idea of a ligament stretching with the change of a curve or the fascia stretching. All these little muscles too go, oh, hey, we moved and they've got potential energy. And what do they wanna do? They wanna move back again. They wanna keep going, okay? This is super important, again, for the idea of dynamic balance. Nothing about being static. Okay, and I just got a few more slides before we're gonna do um, application of class here. You already heard about this with the joints, this idea of the compression, decompression. Same thing goes for all the discs, right? Also went through that. Same thing goes with allowing rotation. I think rotation is a very underutilized uh, awakener and stabilizer and teacher of the spine. But you can't do an arabesque without there being rotation. Even if you want to call it the counter rotation, it's still there. In fact, again, more for the next time, the idea that I don't actually, the natural movement is to not do a lateral flexion. For me to do a pure lateral flexion, I'm actually counter rotating. Actual lateral flexion has some rotation as well because we're designed to continually move three dimensionally. As I said earlier, we're always meant to be moving three dimensionally. So for the body to be designed to just do a pure flexion doesn't, doesn't match. Why would I do that? Why would I just do this? I'd probably be turning my head, spiraling around to see what I'm trying to pick up. That's the actual function. Okay, now, one of the biggest mistakes that I think I made and had a pretty big misunderstanding about was this idea of thinking of my spine as my center line. Okay, so now we're getting into what does this really mean in dance ball. If I think of my spine as my center line, I will probably be trying to think of, let's say that version of the obelisk this way, of going, oh, if I was to build a building, I should put, you know, the little bodies, the weight bearing things perfectly stacked on top of each other. Well, that might be true if you're building a building, but you're not, you're being a dynamic moving human. So the idea of stacking our vertebrae one on top of the other is an image that doesn't match the anatomy, okay? It's also an image that doesn't support the movements of the curves, okay? So if we look where that line is, okay, so I've got my um, version of my curved spine here. Okay, and then I'm gonna let my little snake here <laughs> be my center line, okay? So let's say my center line is hanging like that, kind of like in the picture you're seeing there, all right? And you'll see, the, if I was to think of it like the segments of the snake, but think that they need to stack, well, I'm using that image to create straightness. There's no getting around that. Stacking my vertebrae makes me create straightness. But what we actually want is the curves so that when compression, let's say from above happens, my curves all increase and then decrease and increase and decrease, increase and decrease. I'm better with my right hand on top here. Okay. And um, the next picture actually shows something kind of cool here. The, um, see the curve here, say of the cervical making a little triangle out to here, this degree, and then this one's bigger, and then this one's small and all that. The center line is designed to go through these curves so that its compression makes it change. So if, think of, I'm gonna make it just one curve, okay? If I have my center line here, where this hand is, it's gonna compress differently than if I have my center line here. That makes sense? Yeah? It's putting it at a different angle. So the center line is designed to, in a sense, stack up the whole parts, but what we're really stacking up is the force transmission to make all of the curves move in a balanced way. I want my center line coming down so that they press on these curves, moving them 
in opposition, right? One's going to go forwards, one goes back, so that they all have their nice, almost like an oscillation of rebounding here to here, so that I continually bring back in that stretch energy. Right? And then I think that's where we're going to finish for the thing. And now we're going to look at all of our cues and stuff. Okay. So that was a lot of information, perhaps new, perhaps not. The idea that the bodies of the vertebrae, so that's what I got confused with. I'm like, oh, if the bodies of the vertebrae are where my weight goes, then I guess my weight's right here, like in the center of it. And then it's in the center of the next one. And then that kept me with that idea of stacking. So just because it transmits the weight doesn't mean it transmits the weight straight through. It transmits the weight within that wave. Okay, now we're gonna get up and go ahead and feel that, of course. So what we're gonna to aim to feel is the fact that the curves are changing naturally with movement. And the movement we're gonna look at is the idea just of bending and straightening. So plie and stretch. Don't worry about being turned out. In fact, I'd say don't be turned out. So you don't have to worry about any of that, okay? So go ahead and stand up. And let's put one hand on your lower back, so your lumbar, and one hand on your cervical, okay? And don't think of uh, anything in particular. Don't think of making anything happen. Just go ahead and bend and stretch a few times. Now, given the fact that you're all dancers, dance teachers, means you probably have already have some cueing that naturally, instinctively takes over when you do this. Okay, so that's what I'm saying. I'm suggesting you don't turn out so that you don't go into like ballet brain or anything. <laughs> okay, just let yourself bend and stretch. Now, it took me a while to sort of notice and allow, give permission for what ideally is actually happening. Those curves are increasing. So if you were to measure me from head to tail on straight legs, I'm a little bit taller in this line than when I'm on a plie, because on a plie, I'm absorbing shock. If you think about why the body would be wanting to bend, it would be because maybe I'm landing a jump or something. So there's gonna be impact, or even I'm walking, or I'm jogging, or I'm running, whatever. So the bending of the legs tells your body, hey, there's impact that's associated with this. So there's a force absorption. So as I'm doing this, all curves are changing, but these ones tend to be the ones that are easiest to feel. When I'm taking my bend, see if you can notice in the cervical and lumbar that there's an increase, a deepening of the curves, and then a lengthening of the curves. A deepening of the curves, and a lengthening of the curves. It will be subtle, but it's important, okay? That deepening of the curve, and lengthening of the curve. Now, I'm not talking about the fact that there's a student who's gonna suddenly go, who and stick their tail out, but that's often why they do it. There's, that's a whole, you know, song and dance unto itself right now, but <laughs> right now, let's just say, um, it doesn't necessarily mean the naked eye sees it. In fact, when you do it so much like that, it's because something else isn't happening and it's not being distributed subtly through the whole system likely because it's not happening in the pelvis, which will, again, that's pelvis is next week. Okay, so I'm deepening the curves and lengthening curves. Notice I'm saying lengthening the curves, not eliminating or flattening. Deepening and lengthening. Deepening and lengthening. Now, how's that going for you able to feel that? And notice that it happens just a little bit? Now, it took me a bit of time because I had such a habit, a muscular habit of preventing that from happening. So one of the best things you can do now is you go, if I'm not sure, and you're going, well, she seems to talk a good game, but I don't know if I really believe her on this, then do the opposite. Okay, so just get up and try the opposite. So if this was deepening and lengthening, now let's do the opposite. Let's lengthen our curves when we go down and deepen them when you come up and see how that feels. Lengthen them when you go down and deepen them when you come up. Now, ironically, that's what a lot of people do. A lot of dancers do that. They let their tail hang so much that it lengthens stuff out. But if you're noticing, you'll even notice that almost tail tuck puts pressure to the sides of the knees. 
Okay, so if I lengthen and then deepen it, it's kind of like I compress back down. And this does not have shock absorption. It's the opposite. I didn't let my curve increase with the shock, getting the stretch energy ready to also take me off. The other really cool thing, right? I think anyway, is when I'm increasing those curves. So again, think of that stretch going back, increasing the curve. This energy here is what actually creates me coming up. So if I do let that stretch happen, then all those little muscles are ready for me to come up. Okay, so the truth is, you do lengthen your spine, but you don't do it voluntarily. You don't do it on purpose. You do it as a response to having let the curves deepen for their force absorption. So that's the big for me is I think a lot of teachers, maybe um, great dancers who became teachers but weren't really teachers first, if they really let their body move appropriately, they're feeling that lengthening. They're noticing it because it feels light and it feels good. So they communicate that and say, well, let your spine feel light and lengthen that spine. But they're only sharing what they feel, but they were perhaps, because it's natural, unaware of the cause. So they were communicating the effect, not the cause. And I think that's where we get into trouble. So I know that I heard lengthen your spine for decades. I also know that I had the chiropractors I shared earlier telling me about my seventh cervical of myself and all my students because I've been over flattening. Okay. I also know that I go, do I just seriously have to get even stronger and stronger and stronger? Or maybe something was a little off compared to somebody who let that happen. And I got more tired. I didn't jump as high. And you're looking, you go, ah, oh, why, why, why? <laughs> And maybe it's because I took, you know, as a good A plus student, I took the length in your spine and kept it all the time and did it full on all the time. And I got into a polarity. So if you think of something dynamic and alive, like all your tissues, and I just do this all the time, how elastic is that? It's not very dynamic at all. In fact, I'm like trying to headbutt it to maybe make it move. It barely moves. And I thought it was strength. It wasn't, it was tension. Okay. Now, young people are, especially those keeners, you know, they're really wanting to please you. And if they don't yet know to calibrate the difference between feeling strong and feeling tense, I do think that's our responsibility. And for me, I would err on the side of a missing out on a few strengthening moments, but avoiding at all costs tension because tension is going to mask the sensation they will slowly and surely be having tension creeping in and having them less able each year to feel and take ownership of their own body. So that somatics idea of really being able to feel, you're, taking, you're disempowering them if you're doing anything that allows tension to creep in. And we could talk about the payoff of that, you know, like when you're 35, what's it being like to be in a tense body your whole life? <laughs> Not very emotionally healthy either, right? Okay, so avoiding tension means we have to maybe re, um, re look at what our strength is. What are we going to, what are we planning with strength? And I think there's strength to developing a muscle. Yeah, but strength when we talk about posture, that's what I'd like to use the rest of today about is understanding dynamic posture instead of strong, which often becomes held, which actually throws off the whole system. So now just to prove that to yourself even more. Go ahead and let's do the correct deepen and lengthen, okay? And do just even light jumps. I'm not seeing your feet. Don't care if you point your feet. Just do a few light jumps, keeping your hands there and see if you can feel that I'm allowing, in fact, start to put them in sequence so that it's actually like that ball bouncing. And think of a ball bouncing, right? It goes squish, release, squish, release, squish and release, squish and release, a natural flow, okay? I don't get my natural flow if I jump stay and then magically you know just use my power to come up again i get my bounce when i go down and automatically rebound okay so this is a little bit about timing am i going to keep my timing happening and one thing that i find fascinating is that when you bring back the deepen and lengthen naturally you will also find 
you are way better. You can kind of like put your jumping timing on a dial and actually adjust. If my spine is stiff, and I'm gonna get you to try that, but you only have to do like two or three because it'll feel gross. <laughs> if I try to jump with my spine perfectly held, um, all that happened, there wasn't this absorption through the whole system. There was a gravity went, knees, knees bend. Maybe I can slow down a bit in my thighs, maybe a bit in my feet, maybe. But what you'll find, these are the kids that jump and land and stop and stop. And they're just using their power to go every time they get exhausted. You've done 16 shanjwas and you're like, oh my God, okay? And you're exhausted because you didn't use your rebound. And they also can't speed up. So they're not very good at slowing down and they're not very good at speeding up. They have like their sweet spot of jumping tempo. If you find that happening to yourself or others, it's probably because you are resisting resiliency in your spine, okay? And as soon as I resist resiliency in my spine, meaning my curves are changing, I can fuse the resiliency of my thigh muscles. I can fuse the resiliency of my calf muscles and my feet. It, it's kind of, you know, like I dare you to um, try squeezing your butt and not squeeze your jaw. Like they tend to go together, <laughs> tension somewhere, shoot, somewhere else. So if I've got great resiliency in my spine because I'm letting my curves express themselves, which does not mean they exist. That is not your curves expressing themselves. Your curves expressing themselves means they change. And that was the big one for me where I went, oh, I have curves. I'm letting it be curved. Yay. Well, yeah. Are you letting the curves change when you move? And if I, and I wasn't, I was being a good girl and holding my posture <laughs> really, really steady and lengthening my spine, not letting it change and not being able to find the same rebound in the arch of the foot where it's gonna go same thing. And then the way the muscles of the, the calf and the thighs work as well, okay? So that's number one is, let's just try two or three where you are holding your posture, which means you haven't let the curves do their job of either force absorption or return of energy and feel what that feels like. You'll find you really have to do it in your feet yeah. So I feel like I'm jumping with my legs. And I only want to do a few because I know my point and it just feels so gross. But if I let my curves change, doesn't mean I've let go of my posture. It's now my whole body's jumping and I'm probably jumping for joy too. And there's going to be a, a natural feeling there. You don't have to tell them to smile. Maybe it actually feels good. Okay, so that's number one. So, you know, this idea of lengthen the spine, you know, I've heard it thousands, tens of thousands. Gosh, it could be a hundred thousand times in my career. And I said it a lot too. I'm not gonna say it anymore. I would just talk about resiliency and bounce and talk about the fact that it's going to change. And I would make sure that I am, let's say correcting the student. So here's the piece too. We get caught up in this idea of what's good here must be good here. Well, I'd say a ball squishing down, force absorption is an entirely opposite concept to return of energy. So I've got my force absorption here, the squish, and then the return here. The squish being my curves increasing and then my curves lengthening, okay? They're opposites. So if I'm correcting a student or giving a cue about how to have my posture on straight legs, you know that if you don't change and tell them also, by the way, it'll feel a little different when you plie, then they're gonna keep it. So I think we need to be super careful about saying, okay, I'm gonna maybe adjust posture, but I actually, I'm gonna put out to you now, go, you know what, wouldn't it be interesting to adjust the posture in the plie? where the pelvis can hang easier through those hips anyway, and let the lengthening of how the anatomy was designed to take place during the straightening, which is when it was designed. So I will not ask a student already on straight legs to lengthen. I will let them go into their bend, their plie or their fondue, and then say, as you go, do you feel the lengthening? Do you feel the natural up? And yes, they can, and they probably will. And you will need to be careful on those super, you know, straight A type students that they don't think that 
I now need to lengthen more. If some is good, more is better. We have that attitude a lot just in life, don't we? <laughs> and you can talk to them about like, I don't know, maybe adults, you can say, well, vitamins are like that, right? Do you, you know, do you really want to take all the vitamins or the ones that, you know, you become toxic in? Like we have to have it, but it's the right amount. So it's sort of about dosage. And your body is brilliantly designed to do the right dosage. We don't need to overdose on purpose. Okay. And then that brings, of course, to another sort of confusion I just want to talk about briefly here is just the concept of the word stretch. I know when I think of the word stretch, I can think of I'm, you know, stretching my feet or I'm pulling something long. I'm stretching behind my knee, that type of thing. But I can also think of I'm stretching my muscles. Now, if I was to stretch my calf muscle, I'm actually bending my knee. So I think the word stretch is also something that puts a lot of confusion into the dancer's mind, okay? So I could be holding a stretch in my muscles where I'm actually lessening my power, as I mentioned earlier, or the type of stretch that would be really interesting to make it more part of how you, you talk about things would be again, me and my little demonstration here, but the stretch energy. If we talked about, it's almost like there's three stretches, stretch your muscle, stretch out a joint, utilize and, and um, exploit almost stretch energy. And it's unfortunate that we tend to use the word stretch for those two, because then when we want to talk about huh, the third one, <laughs> it becomes like, what the heck is stretch energy? Okay. And as much as you can maybe say, I'm going to find the stretch energy by finding that nice little six, eight for them to jump to or something like that. Again. If they only have a sweet spot for their jumping, chances are they're holding their spine. And what you found for them is the perfect just reaction of the legs, but not the whole body. If it's jumping with the whole body, you can do a whole bunch of different speeds. Okay, so let's clear up the idea of stretch. And that might be the sort of conversation you have with your students and go, you need to know there's three types of stretch. And maybe in your class, you come up with a fun word for something else. You know, you might say we're doing a joint opening, open the joints of your foot. Maybe you might say that. Uh, maybe you might say lengthen your hamstrings when you're doing a hamstring stretch. So you were the, use the word lengthen. And then maybe stretch can be reserved for that idea of stretch energy. That's up to you to play with and talk with your students and go, I actually wanna know what you're thinking here because let's not be confused. The way our body works on this phase is opposite to this phase. They are opposites. Our bodies respond in opposition, as in movement, okay? Now, along that idea is a little bit more, is of course talking about posture, good old posture. Okay, let's just stand up. I, all I want you to do is stand still with your eyes closed for approximately a minute, that's all. All right, so here I go. I'm not gonna time you, I'm just gonna kind of do a feel of about a minute or so. And just stand still, scan through the body, just making sure you're not you know, gripping your glutes or anything like that. And please do close your eyes. Okay, go ahead and open your eyes. All right, did anybody notice that it's pretty challenging to stand perfectly still? <laughs> yeah, so we have something built, again, our brilliant design built into our system that's referred to as postural sway. And you kind of do, no, no matter how much you try to stay still, there's going to be this constant little sway. Now, the reason for that, oh, great, Tanya, yeah. The reason for that, Remember the picture on the slideshow of the little tiny muscles that were say vertebrae to vertebrae? Okay, all those little tiny muscles, which you really gonna have a heck of a hard time trying to voluntarily do something. So if I said, okay, ladies and gentlemen there, let's, uh, let's contract the multifidae 
between T11 and T12. Okay, go. And you'd be like, <laughs> what? Uh, no, <laughs> no connection because they're just our little tiny, they're like the little adjusters. Okay. Now they behave like good old stretch energy. And that is they need and they want a little bit of movement and response, a little bit of movement and response built right in. Not because we suck at being on balance, but because we're not supposed to be still. Because this is what keeps the return of the energy going. That's what keeps us efficient. Is the fact that we're always distributing the work and go, okay, this side, you do it. Oh, no, you do it. Oh, no, you do it. You do it. No side gets tired. Because it just keeps moving. So this idea of constant movement, little micro movements, like um, suddenly do my hands here, almost like fish swimming through, you know. Just these tiny little movements to keep it going. That's what keeps it dynamic and alive. So when I think of that and realize that those muscles are designed for that without voluntarily, you know, good conscious control, then I better be careful that I'm not overriding them with voluntarily conscious controlled big muscles. So I'm going to trust my dynamic stability to brilliantly do its job. Now, Here's an interesting thing that I will admit I have not done, but boy, oh boy, as I was writing this, I'm going, I think I'm going to try it. And that is, rather than continually always training on a flat surface, which is man-made and not how our bodies were meant to be, what if we were to challenge the terrain a little bit, okay? So if, if this is what's meant to happen to keep everything dynamically alive, what is another way to make it so that I don't mistakenly hold? Let's say I'm doing an adage in the center. I'm just doing a nice devil paid a second. And what do most dancers do? Hold their breath, hang on for dear life. And, and they get rid of the resiliency of their spine. They get rid of the dynamic action of those little muscles. And I go, wouldn't it be interesting? Um, and I don't know if you'd have something you could do. I've got like a little towel here. Just a little face cloth. And I could put one layer, I could fold it over, I could do more. What if I just stuck a towel under my heel? It was like I was out, not on a perfect flat surface, but I was just a little like this. So see if you've got something you can stand on. It could even be like a little thin book or something. So don't stand on it yet. Just hop on up and do like a nice, and you're not out to impress or anything, just do like a double pay to the side. What's it like? What do you tend to do if you're doing a double pay? Are you holding or are you letting the fact that of course there's, there's counterbalance to that leg? Now, how different would it be if I were to challenge my system the way it was designed and knows to be responding three-dimensionally? And so maybe I'm gonna put a towel under my heel and I'm gonna try that. And I go, oh, that feels different. And my little muscles in my spine go, oh, hello. Okay, we got something different to deal with. Try that a few more times with it under your heel. So this isn't the same as you wearing like heel teacher shoes, by the way. <laughs> okay. I was like, oh, that's a little different. Okay. Then just move yourself. So now you've got your toes on it. So now you're on this tiny incline. Like I was doing a double pay walking up a hill just a little bit. Oh, that feels different. Oh, oh, I got to adjust a little differently. Uh, what if you put it only on your outer edge? So the pinky toe edge. And I try doing it there and it's different. I'm like, oh, so as soon as I change the terrain, everything goes doo -doo 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 -doo, adjust, adjust, adjust from the ground up. So think of being on two feet even and then suddenly I do this or I do that or I do this. Everything has to adjust all the way up. And I wake up all of those micro movements that are responsive and natural. So that's my fun suggestion is to do something like that. Like maybe I get like a little um, makeup sponge or two and I'm going to stick it in my, my ballet shoe in a weird place and just do the bar. Maybe I wouldn't do in the center. And they, they, your students will probably think you're nuts at first. <laughs> but if you go, you know what? When I train on a flat surface, it seems like a really great idea. Nothing's changing. I don't have to navigate through it. It's just I can always trust a nice flat surface. But that flat surface kills, if you want to be dramatic about, kills the responsiveness and the need of all the muscles above because they're not adapting. They're not having to be resilient and adaptable. 
on their little micro levels. So that would be an interesting thing to try. What would it be like? It might be fidgety and you might like, oh my gosh, this takes time um, to go, okay, well maybe just put the sponge in the supporting heel and then switch sides and put it in. But it would be fun and it'll be a big exploration. It'll be a great way to introduce the idea of the fact that we were meant to navigate constant change. We're, it, it's a great way to get rid of the hold mentality. We're not here to hold our spine, hold our posture, hold our curves. Just because you might have the curves that they exist doesn't mean you're using them. If I'm not in change and adaptability and resiliency, it confuses all systems. And I would even go so far as to say, when I hold my spine, it's really hard to keep breathing. And um, Gail, you'd mentioned earlier about core and stuff like that. Um, if I'm not breathing, I can't use my core properly. I just can't. Okay, everything's meant to work with everything. And yes, practice balancing on yoga blocks, something like a matter pillow. Oh, absolutely. Balance boards. I got some, well, like the big exercise balls, you know, those are great. I got a little seat one, you know, that it's just a little squishy disc, you know, to keep my core alive while I'm working. That's great. You could stand on one of those. Anything that's about the students understanding that your body is brilliant at constant microscopic change and that that's what actually keeps your energy flowing that's what keeps the, the the force absorption and the energy return in proper balance and that it's always changing so you're going to give permission for things to keep changing and that's a lot about your cues so rethinking some of your um cues and your imagery might be in order okay yes there's nice ones about the tree and the roots and all that but most people think of a trunk as being pretty darn still. So you might want to talk about bamboo and that it's moving all the time and say, I'm not going to say tree anymore just because I want to say roots. Or if you do want to say tree, you say, okay, everybody, I'm saying tree because I'd like to encourage the use of roots. I'm not encouraging the use of a trunk. And you've got to actually go that extra stage to go, hang on, don't use the same cue for everything because everything's got its own abilities, its own responses all the time. Don't, it's not a one size fits all, okay? So I might talk about bamboo, that it's always moving. And then you can say, and by the way, the wind is going all the time. And that's why bamboo survives is because it thrived in a windy place. It's the thing that shows up there, right? And you can talk about that. So giving permission is huge for them to allow the movement and rethinking what well, really, I would just say it's a no hold zone. I don't use the word hold at all. I might say maintain or sustain or something like that. If I want something to sustain through time a little longer. Okay, hope that all makes sense. Have fun with the idea of standing on different things. I think that's a really neat idea. I think it'd be really confusing and really great I did a workshop with a friend of mine all about calf muscles and the three-dimensional use of the calf muscles and realized how much I think I've used my calf muscles fairly two-dimensionally, like they bend and they straighten it and not as much of the constant adjustments. And we've so demonized, you know, rolling and said, yeah, but the muscles that roll, part of it, by the way, pronation is healthy and happens on every bend that you do. But um, that means that if I'm thinking of my, my heel this wide, some muscles are lengthening and some muscles are shortening. And therefore they're staying dynamic and elastic. It's all good. So anytime we can become three-dimensional, wakes all that up, keeps our curves going. I'm just gonna check my notes to make sure I'm not missing something huge, right? And reminding you again, as we just kind of cycle to finish up here about the positive self-talk about the enjoyment of the body. Not just the enjoyment of the step, or the movement or the overall motivation of, I know you're working hard and you can do it, keep jumping higher, whatever it is. But to go, what if I did that devil pay or grand rond boom, and paid attention to my luscious spine moving and adapting the whole time, how that would be. That would feel great, maybe. And if it didn't feel great, you could say to them, do you think it's just that you need to be stronger or is there a, still a different mindset that could provide you with a feeling of, suppleness and strength where you are right now. 
and to say, well, what if, what if you wanted it right now? What could you do if you wanted it right now? And oftentimes then the students need to lower their legs a little bit and they would do it of their own volition, okay? And they would breathe. So the things that we often bug them about going, make sure you're breathing while dancing or smile while dancing, those two things would be like, well, wait a minute, have we inadvertently taken away the permission to breathe? Or have we inadvertently taken away the, the joy of the movement itself? And therefore my smile disappears and my breathing disappears. How to bring it back. So rather than asking for it to come back, think of it as I'm removing the blocks that may have been put on there inadvertently, okay? Now, before we wrap up, I'm just gonna let you know, of course, next week, same time, same place, we're looking at the pelvis. I hope you can join me for that. If you can't, still register. And then I know you want the replay as an email. We'll be looking at the um, pelvis. And if you haven't heard of the word nutation for the sacrum, that'll rock your world, literally rock your world inside your pelvis. <laughs> and it'll make it so you can squat like nobody's business and have healthy hips and knees for a lifetime. And it directly relates to this because of course your sacrum is part of this. So your homework, if you wanna call it that, would be to be practicing the fact that I've got my natural deepening and lengthening. And yes, they lengthen a bit more when I rise, by the way, okay? So the deepening and lengthening of your curves, allowing that to change, playing with changing terrain, that's kind of your homework that will help prepare you and it'll make a great deal of sense what happens in the pelvis if you get this idea of the curves changing, okay? So you can sign up for that. I haven't put the event out yet and um, I will do that later today. I wanted the chance for people to sign up individually. Um, it's interesting to me, even just from a marketing perspective of what did I do that then found these people? And what did I do that then found these people, okay? Also, I, um, I've made it as a free event because it's part of the end of my training here. Donations are welcome, of course. I know it looked weird. I heard this from a couple of people that it looked weird and grayed out, but the donation button actually still works. Not that you have to, just say it does. And I've left it open for the week after, should that be something you want to do. And of course, thank you for attending. And I'll consider it wrapped up now. However, you are welcome to stay for comments or further questions. But for those of you that had to kind of go, this was a two hour workshop, it's uh, 104, we gotta go, then absolutely uh, be on your way, that's fine, happy to have had you. I will, however, keep the recording going for just a little bit more in case there's really good questions that other people wanna hear the answers to. Okay, and I'll send you the recording when it comes through from Zoom and thank you so much for your time and attention. I had fun, I hope you did too, and got some new ideas and we can stop the lengthening. You know. <laughs> and let it become about the resiliency. All right, so thank yeah, well, thank you everybody and unmute if you wanna say anything. And oh, great, Tanya, thank you. Yeah, I hope you can come next week. Again, like I said, go ahead and register so that I, if you can't come, you get the recording and I know you kind of like put your hand up to say, hey, I wanna be here for the recording as well. But the beauty of you being here live right now is that if you have a question, you don't get to ask your question when it's a recording, do you? So if you got any more questions, go for it. I do have to go, but thank you so much. That was great. Really You're appreciate welcome, it. Davina. Thank you for uh, being able to come the whole time too. Yeah, glad that worked out for you. Yeah, it did. Awesome. Yes, great. great. Yeah, I have to go as well. My dinner is ready because it's oh. nine o'clock in the evening for me. Oh, good for you. <laughs> I haven't had dinner yet. <laughs> well, go enjoy. Um, I will, and, and I'll yeah. see you next week. Oh, wonderful. Okay, great. Thanks so much. Okay. Bye. Okay, bye bye. <laughs> And I'm just seeing Stephanie is double hip Oh my gosh, double hip replacement. Oh, Stephanie. Damn, sham. Okay. Yeah. Well, you're going to like the pelvis. Now I have to tell you, I don't have a, a, a lot of, well, I have no personal experience about what a hip replacement means for how the function may change. Um, so if you have any information on that, you want to send me in advance. I'll see if what I can process there. And I have- There's actually, sorry to interrupt. There's actually no information. So- <laughs> Oh, that wow. I can find anyway. So I'm planning on starting a thesis on it next year, but it's great just to have, just to have insights from anyone. Yeah. Okay. Well, I actually, to later tonight, I have a sort of catch up call. Like we have our coaching calls, if you want to call it that leading up to our final exam. And I have, it, it's a dancer as well is for our teacher tonight. So I will ask about 
if anybody, even in my group, has worked with mm -hmm. that would be wonderful. And yeah. and how that changes the function. Now, is there different types of hip replacement? Would it mean you would have had the acetabulum and the the femur head and neck? Like how much? How yep. So I actually had my femur sawed off, and they had to hollow out my pelvis as well because I had hip dysplasia which I didn't learn about until I was 37 and had two kids and was well into my professional dance career. Wow. So okay. it was, I had a full replacement on both sides um, and they used a certain prosthetic called a dual mobility hip joint. Okay. I'm writing that one down, dual mobility. Mm -hmm. So it actually has two joints, two places that can move within the prosthetic, as opposed to the one joint that they typically give to the typical hip replacement patient, which is a, a geriatric patient, of course. Right. Do you think, is that that they're trying to recreate the neck of the femur so that you have movement there, even though we don't actually have movement there, but that... Yeah, well, the reason they give this to younger patients uh, is because it really decreases the rate of dislocation. And they know, well, they hope, I think, that young patients aren't going to be sedentary. Right. Now, do they reattach um, the ligaments? Or everything gets reattached? They, they don't, uh, they don't cut any of the ligaments. Okay. They did have to, they cut through my glute meads. So that's how they got in is they cut, they did the surgery right through my glute meads. Like if you think about like slicing a chicken breast and going through it. Yeah, that's, that's what I'm dealing with. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Well, I, you know, from having not researched it at all, the biggest thing I could say would probably be if you can really understand spine and mm -hmm. sacrum and then mm -hmm. knees, then maybe the transmission through the hip isn't quite as natural as it could be, but that you can still do spine and knee function and to really understand that. So mm -hmm. I'd say, um, well, actually no pelvis. So in the pelvis, the, the movement of the sacrum is probably going to be really interesting for you because again, you've had trauma in the area. So you will have mm -hmm. no doubt blocked off an area through the trauma. And actually, if, if you're interested, um, I'll private message you if you want. Um, I do this thing called injury recall technique which helps to release the trauma from an area, like the mm. that trauma. And um, I had uh, an ankle surgery well, well, at 17 and 24 from a twisted ankle injury. When mm -hmm. I, was, I was just jumping rope, twisted my ankle, like jumped, twisted my ankle, just, and got a bone chip that rattled around in the joint and all that. And then two surgeries to remove that and drill it, all that stuff. And so that joint was stiff for decades. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was permanently that way. And then when I did this injury recall technique, my plie came back like that day. Wow. Blew my mind. And I, you know, crying buckets and all the emotional <laughs> yeah. of having protected my stupid ankle is what I sadly had called it for a long, long time. And so that can be huge for healing there is just, I mean, I know you're not getting blood flow to the joint, but all the tissues around, mm -hmm. what if they can be happy and healthy? What mm -hmm. that would bring. And even just your imagery. So working on the, the, the Franklin method is a lot about imagery. I would say to begin working on the imagery of imagining it to be bone, imagining it to be the original joint and to kind of just toss out the idea that it's different and wrong and, da -da -da. and just put it like, think of it like a puzzle piece that you made your puzzle and you missed a piece. And now you put it back in and it's like this, like maybe it's red actually like stop. And then you're going to go, no, wait a minute. I'm going to take that puzzle piece out again. And I'm going to put it back in so that it looks like the rest of the puzzle. It's the part of the branch or whatever. And just put it back into your body schema. And I think to release the trauma, like if there, I'm assuming there's got to be some held body trauma, even if not functional. Oh, definitely. Yeah. yeah. And to put it back into the picture so that even if you think of like the transmission of the force through, you don't want it to go spine, 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 pelvis, knees like to have this blank spot. You know, so you gotta bring it back into the, the process and into the line. And I don't call it denial. I'd say, this is you going, this is my new version. Mm -hmm. So maybe you don't say it's the old version because actually the old version was damaged. So you could say, this is my, this is my hip. And, and to, to be sure on the labeling. And like I said, even 
I'm just having this sort of intuitive thing of talking about it being like drawing lines through your body, like lines of connectivity. And that to know that the lines say through my foot, through my knee, through my thigh, through my hip, through my pelvis, it's the same color. Mm -hmm. To really make sure that you're letting that happen. Yep. Be really huge. What can I do? What do you do? Oh, just put them. Okay. <laughs> my, my helpers are here. Oh. Okay, 